that you could, could look at. So let me first talk a little bit, want to give you a framework of thinking about it, okay? Now, when we need to communicate with our staff, with our other people in our organizations, frameworks matter because they help us to build up the narratives around it. We can give examples of other places, but it's sometimes helpful to say, well, what is this actually? Why, why does it matter? Okay, and actually today already, several of the speeches we heard from the head of the civil service, the little video you saw, the little film you see, actually has elements on it. And I'm going to try to give you, it is a lecture after all, I'm going to try to give you a little framework to think about of some of these things. Easy enough. Three things that you want, to, want you to think about. That actually digital transformation or digital technology can do for a system you work in. So, and help you to think, you know, why it matters. Now, it's quite important to realize that it's also self-evident sometimes from where we're sitting to imagine what a system can look like. And it's also helpful to realize that even people that technically fully understood it get it entirely wrong how it will look uh, like in the end. You know, it's, it's always nice to be able to remind you that, you know, the chairman of IBM thought there would be five computers in the world. Okay, okay, that's 70, uh, that's 80, uh, 70 years ago. No, but I'm counting 80 years ago. Uh, 80 years ago, he said that. So, but even more recently, someone who was strongly involved in digital companies, something like, you know, 30 years ago, thought the internet would disappear. So, some of the things I'll say, they're probably not entirely right. So, the, the direction of travel is right, but, you know, we will get some things wrong and what it will look like. But the framework I want to give you probably will be relevant even if the technology throws us new uh, ch challenges. And I want to do this first by actually alluding to something you know, but you may not think that much about it. And that's actually, we all operate in an economy that's increasingly digital. You may take it for granted, but I'm old enough to remember, I'm sorry, I can't help wanting to take a picture with my mobile phone. <laughs> actually, this is a mobile phone, but it does other things. It takes pictures. It does other things, but actually, it is actually these days in a country like Nigeria and all over the world, a backbone for a whole series of operations we now take for granted, but actually are still quite surprising. It's more than a phone that we use to call, but it actually is a computer. And it is the entry point for a whole digital system that we take for granted, okay? You take for granted, I bet, that, you know, when you now want to do a bank transfer, well, I should be able to do it on my phone. But you may not think enough about what is the system that's behind it. Because actually the same principles of that system is behind what a digital public service would look like as well. It's an entry point by the phone, and that's what people will have, and it's something similar the firm will have. This is what you have in that system. You know, this is what you then use to get maybe a taxi, an Uber. Uh, you will maybe do increasing some shopping about it. You will use this as your entry point for communication and indeed for news and for receiving news. Now, that's important because what it hasn't done, it has, hasn't got rid of taxis, there's still shops, <laughs> there's still banks, there's still newspapers, there's still news agencies, there's still these things like that. But they changed the system by which services are delivered. And what it comes from, not from just some, oh, well, a little small change to it. No, no. When someone who runs a bank had to think about how do I do this digitally, they had to re-engineer, rewire their system. And it's that rewiring that, that has been done, for example, in the transport market because of Uber. That is a very different system that actually changes how we use it, but also how we can benefit from it. And of course, with risks. And there's some governance issues as well, and I will come back to them. And there's three things that whether it's a business, or whether we do it in a public system, 
that are important, you know? And so why and, and, and what are the kind of things we end up doing when we digitalize? Well, the simplest one is that we are going to use something digital for something that used to be analog. So inputs that we now don't use anymore because these are analog inputs. So let me give some examples. And of course, we talk about automation. Now, what's important, what I tell you, I hope all of it is important, but it's important also what will come next. Because the problem sometimes is, is that as far as we get in thinking about the system, we think about, let the machine take over because it does it better and does it cheaper. Now, it often does it, you know, if, if what we hear to her today, the system is being um, automated, well, there's no more paper stuff, there's no more printers, there's no more storage. Indeed, fewer people may be needed for various of these things. Of course, it also brings in every system, just as like in the economy, fear. Oh my God, do I really have to be the one that's going to get rid of a lot of people? Am I really going to be the one to doing it? And just that fear that is in, in, in the whole economy of the future of work obviously is in the system too. So automation matters, but at the same time, there is this kind of fear factor is there. Probably nothing more so than me as working in university and having to mark typewritten pieces of work by my students and suddenly discover that there is this animal, chat GPT. Now, if there's anyone in the room who's never, who doesn't got an account for chat GPT, I would say, look, please do get a, a free one. It's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing because it will write your letter for you. It will write all kinds of things. It, does, it writes your job application for the next post. You know, be very careful. You may automate your systems, but everybody is going to write these things now. What it actually means, we have to rethink some of the things we do. In fact, if I was the head of the of service, or indeed of the Civil Service Commission, I would now systematically for every job application, ask JetGTP to write an application for it and store it and compare it with all the applications you get so that you do better when you next time apply for your next job. Oh, I said do better. That's more efficient. I'm actually forced you to think more carefully why you would do that job better. And that actually is the efficiency improvement. It doesn't get rid of you. You just have to raise your standard. That's how you think of it, okay? So there may be certain processes done, but we as humans in the system have to raise our standard. The moment a calculator was introduced and we didn't have to time spend the time doing by hand the calculation, we had to raise our standards in what we did with these numbers. That's the opportunity you have in your system. It doesn't get rid of people. In fact, most research tells us that even in the economy, it won't get rid of people but it will transform what people do. And in this case, that gives them more time to do better, to be better things. So that's the first thing. It automates substitutes, but it allows you to be more efficient. And that's an important part to actually do this. So even in your teams, encourage them, please don't write, you write a letter, let ChatGPT write it for you, and then let's make a better letter more suitable for this thing. That's a better use of your time than actually writing that, 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 that letter. Okay, so that's the first thing. But it's not where we stop. It's a mistake to keep on talking about digitalization as if it is automation. It's actually not just that. And the main benefits, and they've already been alluded to, is that allows better interactions within the system and, be, and with, the, with citizens and firms. It's about interactions, okay? Let me simply say it. Why does Uber make money? It's because it has data on where its taxis are, where the people are, and learns to think about the more efficient way of matching these. So that's how algorithms, platforms uh, make help you to get money. 
How does, uh, how can Twitter make money? Twitter can make money because it optimizes to see what things you want to see and it places ads that are suitable for you in it. This is actually the system begins to operate more efficiently. Now, what does it mean in the things we talk about in a civil service? So the simplest thing to think about is, what does it mean if the interactions become more efficient? It's essentially saying there is less time and cost involved in interacting with each other. Okay? So there's less time and cost involved in interacting. So for example, rather than paper files that have to be moved from one of those to the others, they're centrally stored. And anywhere, anywhere, uh, anyone, anywhere can call them up. There's no more, oh, well, you know, the file is on its way from the other side of Abuja. No, no, the file is there. It's there, it's stored, and it's there. So that's, that's a useful thing. Now, of course, we need to move a little bit further. And for example, once you start having well-functioning ID systems, you could get a situation what I described in Rwanda. If you have a well-functioning system where all these records are linked to an ID number via an electronic system, I can sit in a health facility and get my records called up. I can sit in a court in the rural areas. I can actually get a file, a relevant file, transmitted from another court and actually make sure that it's all connected. I can do these things. I can get the system to, to work cheaper, more efficiently together. Better interactions. But the one thing we tend to forget a little bit, where actually the biggest advantage would be, is that there is data creation. There is actually a massive informa new information created through this digital system because every time a digital transaction is done, there is essentially a data point created. You know? Every time you send a WhatsApp message to someone else, there is actually a data point, which is different from when you meet a person and you just greet them and shake their hand. There is no data point created. Actually, digitally, all these interactions, they create data. Now, oops, I touched this here. Now, any data are very easily stored and potentially used. So you could potentially get a fully linked system of data, of information, and, um, and of, of records, but also integrate them. You say, okay, that's self-evident. Now, so where does the benefit from interactions come from? Um, I hope you'll forgive me that I found a cartoon. It was in The Economist six years ago. And it was about Nigerian bureaucracy. <laughs> and this was the picture they used as the illustration of Nigerian bureaucracy. So, and what did they say? Well, actually, the processes hold a lot of things back in the economy. Now, in two ways. One is this, it takes a lot of time. Look, I've been sitting inside, and the outside always tells us these things. Sitting there, it takes a lot of time, because there's lots of rules, procedures, and so on. We need to follow them. Now, of course, you see already here the advantage, because if you could save time and transactions costs, and time actually is an important transactions cost, you could begin to actually move first faster. Of course, I didn't tell you entirely what the article was about as well. And what the article was actually about, about a lot of stories of, you know, if I run a business here, I may get all kinds of taxes I need to claim to, to pay from very different authorities, including for things that probably I'm not really owed, but they don't go away, and somehow or another some side payment is done. I hope you understand what I mean. There's things happening in the system, and many of you are, uh, that I've spoken have alluded to. Of course, this is another transactions cost. If I want my file to be approved, I may have to pay something somewhere. Now, the point is here, is that actually 
systems and rules are often designed with the best of intentions. But every time there is a moment of human contact anywhere in the system, you create an opportunity for rents being extracted. When I'm in the DRC and I want to ship something across the Congo River towards the west of the country, from the middle of the country to the rest, from Equateur to the, towards the, the west of the country, I need apparently 32 permits for a ship to move things around. If I want to export coffee from Atade in Congo, I need 52 permissions and 13 stamps. I don't know whether you've ever noticed whether there's coffee exported from Atadi. Of course, at some point there isn't anymore. There is no cargo traffic on the Congo River. When you're there in Equateur, there is not a single ship moving anything anymore. Because in the end, the system becomes so expensive from this type of transactions cost, and this was not time, this was essentially bribes, that actually at some point the whole business disappeared. Now, this is what they are alluding to, fairly or unfairly, but, you know, there are some issues there. This is what we're talking about here as well. Once you get a digital system, and the head of civil service has already alluded to it, you can actually manage this because you create a data point for every interaction. Now, it's very important, and I'll come back to that later, it has to be a system. It can't be something where, yes, you can upload all the forms, and now please, once you've uploaded, you're allowed to come to the till and talk to the person, and then we'll have a conversation, and then I can on the system approve it. Because that's just not helping us. <laughs> a digital system means these contacts become less and only are there when they really needed to be there. So you simplify the system and so you reduce the touch points where things can go wrong. And then you can manage. Then you get data. You can do performance management for your algorithms. And this is exactly what Uber does. This is exactly what the bank will do to see, well, is the system, sorry, is the system working well. They have data and they will see, oh, can I optimize it? You can do amazing things, actually, once you set services up as an integrated digital platform. You can really monitor how long it takes, where the bottlenecks are, who's performing, is not doing. And that's actually, in a sense, for leaders, provides an opportunity. Now, people don't have to be terrified, but it can be done. So this is what businesses do they haven't simply said, oh, you just use your phone for exactly the same. They know very well what their advantage is because they get data and they can monitor the speed of transactions. They can improve their, their business performance. You know, we always say, oh, they get the data so they can use them for something else. Actually, the first thing they will use it for is to actually make money with their own business model. This is, for you, the first thing you can use it to get the system more efficient. And then you can create transparency. For example, we know in many countries moving from an electronic, from a payroll that has basically involves trucks driving around, delivering money to the next post and handing it out to make electronic transfers could get rid of a lot of uh, problematic uh, payments, including lots of ghost workers. Provided, of course, those people who control the system keep honesty. We're not going to get rid of the need for honesty in it. In the DRC in Congo, where I work quite a lot, they had this problem where cash loads of money would go from every capital down to the provincial capitals and then, from the, and then so on. And the health workers had to wait until the money was there. Then it went to the health bureaus in the district capitals. And then it went up to the hospitals. Of course, when you then visit it, the hospitals, they hadn't been paid for many months because somehow or another, a little bit more was taken from each of the trucks and there was nothing left to bring to the, to the doctors. So the doctors weren't paid. So they moved to an electronic payment system. The only problem was 
that suddenly there was a new richest man in the civil service. There was the guy who was actually typing in all the numbers on the list. <laughs> and he would charge a fortune to get your name on the list so the doctors were still not being paid. So you have to be keeping the system there. But if I was the head of civil service, it's a bit easier to monitor that than to monitor all the different layers and layers and layers. So you can actually begin to build up a system. It's actually with that that in India, a lot of people have been added to benefit lists for political reasons that actually clearly didn't satisfy the conditions. So once they introduced an electronic payment system linked to an ID system with very clear social registries who should receive benefits, a billion dollars was saved. The leakage was reduced by a billion dollars. That included also small cash payments that people had to pay to simply get the benefit. One billion dollars of savings per year. As again, it doesn't solve everything, but it just provides you with a mechanism, a transparency with the data that actually you can begin to do it. So for all of you, that see the digital systems evolving in their structures, you have to ask yourself, where are now the points of transaction where the risks are? How have the risks been changed? And actually, can we, can we find ways, control mechanisms, audit mechanisms, that actually we look at these? Very easy gains actually to be made, something that your superiors uh, should be very proud of. Now, this is all in somehow within a system improving it to some extent. Now, one of the big weaknesses, and can I be frank, some of the things I've observed in Nigeria, what's being done, what's being done looks a bit like this, is that we haven't changed our mindset enough away from trying to digitize the analog system. We haven't tried to imagine what the system could look like if we make it digital. Okay? And this is about system change. Okay? Now, this is a bit like encouraging you tonight to think, how does Uber make money? How has it reorganized things? How does a bank that uses electronic payment systems and, does it, and arguably charges considerably less for each transaction, if that's the case, and I think that's the case, well, how do they then make, start making money? How, how do they do that? How do they rewire, reorganize their system to actually be more efficient and for a private business means makes man, more money? And here it is to getting better services. And the problem is, is that sometimes we think too much, is that, okay, so, now you apply online for something and now upload 55 documents that normally you used to hand in into an office. Now, it's great because they're centrally stored and they can be checked by others. But I'm afraid the PDF is not a digital document that you can easily search. PDF is actually a pretty bad format because it's not digitized. It's not a digital format. It's actually a hard, an analog thing that is saved so that you have a number to it, but you can't search the document easily. You can, but it's a bit more complicated. So you don't really have an ability to really start linking the whole thing. So you have to ask yourself, you know, is that the best way? Because in an analog world, surely you come to the office, I need some this kind of permit, these are my documents. Are there other ways, for example, to prove my identity, to prove my tax records, and so on? And this is what we begin to talk about. How do you actually begin to change that to think carefully about where we get rid, actually, of scanning? To be honest, it's about how can we get rid of scanning because that's a lot of time and a lot of expense as well. And these are massive files and the payments you need to do for storage are not trivial. Okay, so how do you begin to do that? Okay, and so it's about thinking about the system. Now, the way typically the system needs to be thought of is somehow or another that every firm and every citizen, and I would say probably linked to that also every transaction, gets a unique ID code. Okay, 
we have something here. We have the NIN for, for individuals, unique code. We have an electronic ID. It's linked, not quite linked. <laughs> so there is some issues there. And it's still the case often that if you have to apply for something here, the ID card is not the sufficient identifier. In fact, many of your departments use other ways that people need to prove themselves. Uh, a bank uses their own system, a uh, biometric system, others have that. So we, we haven't moved somehow to something that is unique that can actually link it all. Because the interactions and the linkages is where the return will come from. So the system in government needs to be, can we find ways increasingly to make sure everything is linked. And the process of a unique ID, of which you're making good progress, by the way, this is not trying to be critical, but maybe not fast enough, but you need to have that. The same for a firm, a unique identifier, so that everything that firm does is linked to it, okay? Then you need to somehow making sure that all the payment systems are linked. I think you're getting there. You know, other countries have made other choices, but you're getting there. Okay, so there is somehow, but you need to have something, a payment system that can be used for everything. You know, I like them to be totally interoperable. People running a bank or microfinance institutions may not necessarily like that, but I like the idea that they need to be fully interoperable and actually making it therefore competitive and as cheaply as possible. And then, and then importantly, Importantly, you want to make sure that these identifiers, in actually integrated with the payment system, link to everything to do with where your data are stored. So the dream would be that if I've once put in a building application scanned the document, it is automatically linked to that ID and everything, if I have anything I ever do, potentially it can be linked. Or if, I'm, if I have a credit history and a tax record, that there is a way, what you now see in some countries, that if I want a loan from a bank, the only thing I have to do is to give a system permission to access a document or send that document automatically to the bank so that I don't have to get that document, scan it, and then send it back. So that's what we're talking about. So you think about, and, and think about anything you do in the digital, Am I able to move towards something like that? And so the idea could be, can you get to a single window, for example, where firms would transact everything? You know, if we now have quite a lot of taxes, and yes, you know, different departments have levies, taxes to a firm, wouldn't it be logical for a sensible domestic investment climate that actually everything could be linked? And that everybody could see within the tax authority, this is the total tax this company pays, and not just all the bits and pieces. For efficiency, for red tape, for transparency, and indeed, for a lot of scope for corruption. Because then everybody can check, you know, look, this is a bit peculiar. This is a hotel in the city, and it pays, as the economist alluded to, a specific tax for having bicycles and carts. Now, why does it do it? No, it probably paid it because it didn't want to see this person keep on harassing them. But you can actually see, look, this is not a tax you should ever be. Plus, someone higher up in the system gets a simple algorithm to check what is the taxes that a firm like that pays. Does that sound right? Does that sound, do they pay too much, too little? Do they get all kinds of things and so on? So you build up your system that actually can begin to work. So what we call this... This is a, a fashionable world, but it, where it is but very useful. People talk about it. You have to build up a digital public infrastructure. We're talking not about the hard infrastructure. It's not about the electricity or the computers. It's about the soft infrastructure, which is basically have somehow a secure ID that you can use for anything, have a payment system that can be integrated with your ID, and that you have a data storage but also exchange mechanism. Yeah? And we call that a foundational structure. And basically, that's thinking of digitization not as let's have an analog system and we just scan it all, but it actually becomes a new system that works better together. And I'll come in a moment to some examples. And that comes to the design. Okay? So some of you, a few of you may be involved in the design. Most of you will always be some users, but I want to get you a sense 
of what a good design could look like, so that whenever you get another tech wonk coming and talk to you, you know what questions to ask. Say, you know, does it has this feature? And I'll get a few of these. So let me get the building blocks of that system briefly explained. Well, there probably is not a better example all over the world than what India has done. I think there is no better example that anyone has done in the world than India. Forget Singapore or Estonia, definitely forget the US and Britain, India. Okay? And it's really fascinating what they've done. Okay? They build up very fast a unique ID system called Adhar. Everybody talks it's just Adhar, but the other elements of what is called India stack are just as important. They then designed, and by the way, the unique identification system is designed in such a way that it is secure and totally with respecting um, uh, privacy. If I go to a business, like I apply for a job, and I need to somehow identify myself, I can get somehow or another permission for once in a very particular way, the firm to check whether you are who you are. I can go to a bank and it is your KYC, know your customer. It's sufficient. But it's just once and it's totally secure. The bank doesn't get anything other information than just saying essentially yes, no. It doesn't get anything about you. It doesn't get anything else that's stored. Very smartly to make that possible given cybersecurity risks, I don't know why I suddenly look on the military side, <laughs> but given cybersecurity and security risks, it actually, it's very little minimal information, just enough to uniquely, identi uniquely identify the person. And that's really helpful because then you can say, look, we can allow all kinds of people to use it, and we don't have to worry about it. So it's just a yes, no. So they did that. And then they built on top of that, essentially, which is literally something like 10 lines of programming code, a unique payment system. So a universal, sorry, it's called a UPI, Universal Payment Interface. Okay, come to think of it, it's like a little bit of text that in the software code was added and that they basically told anyone ever wanting to do a financial transaction have that little bit in it. Because it actually is the one that first, first of all, allows the transaction to happen, but also makes it fully interoperable. So I can send with WhatsApp money to my bank account without much trouble because that little API is there. I can do it from a QR code with my phone and I can pay anything even if I don't have a bank account. I can do it from my mobile uh, money that's sort there. So you can do everything. And so it's basically universal little protocol. Now, I think in Nigeria, the way payment system has evolved, you do not necessarily have to have that private, sorry, public, as this. In India, it was quite important because they were really behind in the digitization in the payment system. And it now says, if you went to India five years ago compared to now, the transformation is mind-boggling. Virtually not many people only now have their phone. It's nothing else. And you could be an ordinary junior civil servant, the only thing you have is your phone to do everything. You have nothing anymore to deal with your bank or to do anything, or money, indeed. And of course, it's all linked to safe data storage systems. It's linked to safe data storage systems. Now, in India, they've been very, very smart at it because they build it in, and it's a publicly provided system where actually certain data can be stored and you still own it. So you, even if the government wants to use it, an individual has to give permission. I think it's really smart. So you keep on owning your data. Remember, that's what we always complain about with Google and Amazon. They have all our data. Not in this system. You, you can own them. They can set it up. And so they set up a system that now you get to a situation in India since actually about last year with, with a final bit data exchange. I can apply for a loan. And for the bank, a standard normal bank to approve it, and I want to make sure they see my tax records, my credit histories, everything else. There's not a single thing I need to scan. There's not a single thing I need to actually do in person. I can do it entirely digitally. And so I can do this. That seems to be it. Okay? So you could provide it as a government. And the success is there. 
There's now 2 billion bank accounts linked to the system. More than 1.2 billion people have an ID system. It's, the population is just under 1.3 billion so uh, at the time of these data. So this is a massive thing, savings of leakage. And it's really to do because they think as systems, you know? They thought of pieces of the jigsaws, they did open source coding, so they wanted to avoid that one big conglomerate would capture everything, so they did it open source uh, coding. So it basically means that somehow or another, we don't get into, I don't know, an Amazon situation or, uh, or some kind of even MasterCard situation where one, ba uh, one system controls all, somehow or another entry is quite easy. You could think about it there. But what I really like is the, is, is, uh, sorry, and it's, it's linked to that last point then, is the interoperability. So, so that you can actually do this. And interoperability, finding ways of doing that is massive. Now, you could say, can we do this in, in Nigeria? Can we do this in Nigeria? Well, there was massive finance and capability available in China. It does help if your economy is growing 6 7% per year. <laughs> and it does help that you have some of the biggest uh, companies in the world working on outsourcing of businesses there. It also helps that the person who was the founder and CEO of Infosys decided to become a public servant for a while. It does help. With Nanda Nilikane doing this, it does help. And we should not underestimate, as a friend from India, an entrepreneur told me, never underestimate the Nandan effect. You need to have champions really wanting to do this. But importantly, what it is important to think about um, is that they thought of it as a design from the beginning. Yeah? Not just as an ID card with a chip, but they actually thought about it, no, how can we make sure that we maximize the moments that you can use what's on that chip. And keep on thinking about it. How can I bring my, uh, my ID card uh, into it? Similarly, it's not simply about scanning documents. It becomes much more. What you can replicate from it, definitely, well, I think you have actually capability here. You have a remarkably dynamic sector here in digital space. There is finance. In fact, there's often a craven for uh, investment opportunities. I'll say a few things more about it in a moment. Of course, infrastructure is a problem. We cannot deny that power is an issue to actually drive the system down. And that, but, you know, you have to think of innovative things. Bangladesh is interesting. That actually says, look, we may not be able to solve it like this, but we could even have a small kiosk with a mini grid and things like that, we can start getting to do it. So we just don't wait for the mains to be there, the, 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 the overall grid. Okay, let me give an example. I mentioned Togo already introduction. It was actually quite remarkable what they did. You know, a fully digital cash transfer system for 12% of the population built in 10 days. This was Gina Lawson, Minister of ICT there. That was quite an amazing thing. Okay, Togo is worth thinking about it. And what they did, they had the ID, they had the mobile payment system, they had thought about how we properly link it for, for properly identifying people, how did they do that. They used all the data they had with machine learning and 10 days later they had algorithms to actually do this and deliver cash to people. That was Togo. You know, Togo is not the richest country in the world, okay? It's poorer than Nigeria. They managed to pull this off, much smaller to do this. I mentioned earlier, Rwanda cases, other cases, you know, there are countries that are small and definitely not richer that can pull this off. But India tells us also we need to think of a couple of things. And let me hurry up and not keep you for very much longer. There is a governance challenge, okay? And, you know, we may roll this out and there will be pushback from there will be civil society people that say, oh, the government is getting all this data. There will be all kinds of things that will be happening also internally on the governance, you know? Who, who, will, who will decide? Is it, you know, what is the role for the constitution, the protection of people, and so on in it? And then also, there's a huge challenge of inclusion. And I would actually want to say is that if you design it, don't just enjoy what I just talked about, all the technical part, if you think politically, you better think about these last two things as well. If you exclude people in a large scale, get in trouble, and if you forget the governance challenge. Actually, in India, 
the system was almost derailed because they rolled out a system of Adhar without the law having been voted in Parliament. There was actually no proper regulations in place to actually do it properly. So it went to the Supreme Court and actually the system had to stop for a while. And I'll tell you a little bit what happened next. Similarly, massive protests from civil society because they said, but look, at the time that you roll it out for the benefits, there are people who don't get it. How are you now going to deal with that? And so you got a real big backlash around it. And I'll tell you in a moment how you can deal with it. The government challenge, of course, if you think developmental or economic or service delivery from the thing, of the, from the state, you want to be able to do this because actually the opportunities are immense, okay? But you have to think about what you do with your data, okay? Now, it's very tempting, and allow me to be blunt for a moment, and I was yesterday over dinner reminded of that. You know, it is the case that Mr. Kagame loves his system with few safeguards because it provides massive opportunities also on the security front and the, and the, and the monitoring front. I think Nigeria is a different society. You want to think about it, what you can do, because it is true that you want to look for ways that the security system can use to the extent that it's required. At the same time, you want to make sure that nobody abuses the access to the data. So you want to think very carefully about the nature of how you restrict access to all these data. So it's huge debates in the West, and in fact, we don't get anywhere because it just dominates it all. And literally, we don't get anywhere, almost to the point that we're wasting and throwing away some of the opportunities in Europe for being able to do it. Now, what is really interesting in India, once the Supreme Court stopped Adhar, I remember meeting Nanda Nelikani, so the person in charge, and publicly he said, oh, well, we can deal with it. He said, I was actually rather pleased that the Supreme Court told us this. Because I'm a technical person. If someone tells me what the legal code says, I know what to put in my computer code. And so they actually used the law as an instruction and the judgment as an instruction of how to now program the safeguards. So the Supreme Court was very wisely, got a very sensible judgment, and they managed to program safeguards in the whole system. For example, interestingly, the tax ministry cannot automatically gain access to all the other data. Now you say, mm, maybe not. But there are systems it has to work for very clear things. It can't do this purely out of a vindictive thing. You know, there's certain things that can't be connected. Even in a government department, you may be sitting in a particular ministry, you may not see the, the individual data of a person. You would have to do certain things. That actually makes sense because, you know, rights of privacy exist and, you know, they may be used, but they also may be abused. So you look for these balances and the computer coders, it was all right. In fact, for the whole identification system, I was talking to the person who had to do all the coding and said, oh, wow, uh, the judgment took about six months to come out, took us two days to program, <laughs> and everything was sorted. You know, it's basically, that's what we're talking about. You can do this. So, so don't be stopped by this. You just have to be sensibly and build it in. If there's a right to privacy of the individual civil servant that you want to think, you can program it in. You can do systems that actually do this. And the, the next one is, of course, is the challenge of inclusion, okay? It cannot be a service for the relatively few. We see that in some countries emerging. It's not sustainable, and it never gets to scale, okay? Middle classes may end up using it, and poorer people don't get access, and you start getting a two-tier system, a fast service for one, a slow service for others. It's not right. That's not your duty as a public servant trying to serve all. But of course, that means you have to be really efficient to setting up the system. You know, in the ID card system, yeah, 100 million people, but that's not a population of the country. <laughs> it needs to go faster, okay? India took five years, but they covered close to everybody now, okay? So it needs to be really working uh, fast. 
In India, one of the weaknesses was that actually they linked it to a bank account. So you could ask yourself, is that a way to include people? It may or may not be, but you have to think very carefully about it because then you have to make it very easy to get people access to it. And then, of course, the big one, power. You need to think carefully to design a system that doesn't use too much power and that you may find a way of rolling out in places where they don't have it. Sorry, this is... Um, and basically, what I already have seen from some of the systems that are run from here, you know they've not been optimized for data use? They ask too much data. If you have to scan a document and upload it, you exclude already loads of people with very low data, uh, low, low speed. So you need to design systems and think very hard about it, how you can actually do this. So, and also you need to find ways that if people are not banked, can, how do they then get access, okay? Bangladesh has done it through little kiosks, systems, very low cost things, small, the small entrepreneurs that can actually do this. This was in a way with the M-Pesa system in Kenya as well. You, you, you need to think about how you can guarantee access. Okay, let me now end with a few words on how can we get this done. Okay, and then I want to briefly talk of our experience, not in Nigeria, but in other countries. I think you'll recognize a few of the challenges you may well face. I must say, so we were working with governments, trying to get the basic principles, the first steps around some of these things in place. We had some amazing experiences, and we also had some terrible experiences, okay? And uh, we came down to actually say there's three preconditions you really have to work hard at. The first one is demand, the second one is about capacity and intent, and the third one is leadership, and that's why I'm talking to you. The demand, first of all, it needs to come from the top, okay? Very striking in the countries where we now suddenly see progress, Rwanda, South Africa, President Ramaphosa, Ethiopia with President, Prime Minister Abiy, in India, Modi totally behind it, Bangladesh as well, the Prime Minister totally pushing it. And really saying, look, I want to get regular reports using any data system you've now set up to get it, you know? By the way, sometimes I pity a politician because it's so hard to get data here to actually know how to keep track. They want data, otherwise how can they actually lead? US permanent secretaries, where are your data? This gives you the opportunity, but you have to really work on it, okay? But the demand needs to come from the top. And then it needs to be translated in genuine commitment. We had a country which I will not name. It was not here, so don't worry. But where we were working with the, 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 the chief advisor to the president, who was totally committed to get it done. Little had we known that because of politics in the bureaucracy, he had a terrible relationship with the minister of ICT. Terrible relationship. And basically, nothing was ever done. Because if we worked with the, with the ICT ministry, the presidency was blocking it. And if we worked with the other side, it was blocking it. We can't underestimate bureaucratic politics. I'm sorry, I've been one as well. I, I really didn't like my cabinet office, OK? I always had trouble with it. I thought they were overstepping their responsibility. FCDO should be doing things. I suspect you occasionally have these problems too. You have personality problems in the system. You know, this only can be done, and I observe it here today, by genuine leadership across the system. It needs to be coming there, it needs to be overcoming. In another country, and I'll name it, Ethiopia, they were very committed, but we got stuck with a battle between the, uh, the Ethiopian Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance, where the Ministry of Finance wanted to move very fast with rapidly, you know, this had a, was very much stuck in another age in terms of mobile payment systems, rapidly moving to liberalization. And the central bank said, oh, well, we need to get two, three years to get all the regulations updated. We can't quite do this. And they stopped and they stopped and they stopped and they blocked. And we had to go. Nothing happened. In the end, the prime minister had to unblock it. You know, and it got stuck. And it's a system that we not normally know as a system where bureaucratic politics was blocking each other. So 
just be aware, you know, and I'm sorry, you have to work together. <laughs> you have to work together across the places, otherwise the system will never get integrated. Second thing is, understand the special interests. Fascinating to see how we heard stories from Bangladesh, how they kept on having to really make sure they didn't step on anything to do with the garment sector on the digital economy. Because the garment sector wanted to keep on having all the resources and so on, and they didn't like it that we were talking about other types of businesses and so on. They said, no, no, the core of our economy is that sector, and we can't do it. So they lobbied all the time in politics, no, no, all this ICT stuff, we shouldn't be doing it, because this were new up-and-coming sector in business services. So we couldn't deal with them. In a similar way, they also talked to us about procurement. Special interest in procurement, that yes, you can set up the whole system, but it was that one provider that had to get all the contracts. And as a result, they got very poor systems delivered. Special interest in procurement, I can also use other words for it, are very common across the world. And it's very hard to fight. But if procurement goes wrong, everything will go wrong, okay, in this thing. You're so dependent on getting these things right. And procuring the right things for this is really hard. And of course, it links to the final thing, is avoiding capture. It's basically, sometimes, and I've seen them in London in my office, and I've seen them uh, here in offices, there's someone that promised you the world with a business, integrated business solution, and everything will be fine. You know, there will all the time be a business that wants your proprietary system. Remember, the system has to be able to talk to each other. You have to be really careful that it's not captured by, you know, say one business that gets now the monopoly service provider, because then it all goes wrong very soon. These systems have to be able to talk to it. Interop the question to ask, can you make the system interoperable? Can you make the system open source? Very good questions to ask to anyone who offers you a technology solution. And then we will tell you, well, that's not how we do it in the US. Well, that's also why India looks better now than the US on digital issues. <laughs> so be very careful with these things. And then finally, well, it's about the people have to do it, it's the capacity. No, I always put capacity and intent to co together. Yes, there is low capacity, but hey, we can all learn. <laughs> capacity and intent, you know, I sometimes describe it, is the system able and willing to do something? And it is about willing to actually say, look, I know, I, don't know, I know what I don't know, and I know what I know. I know who to ask in my system, and I know and how to work together. Outside the system, also I think actually inside, but outside definitely in Nigeria, there's a lot of good, good things. Now, this is not about giving a monopoly contract to one provider who happens to be well connected. Again, that's not quite a solution. I don't know whether you can find, you know, an, one of your 20 smartest tech entrepreneurs that says, look, I'll become a civil servant for two years and I'll help you do it and I'll really subscribe to the rules and the, like in the UK, the civil service code, and I'm going to really try to deliver some public service, and I'm going to be building up a team that will advise and help you all to do this. Maybe something like that. But you really have to be willing to, to deliver it. It can't simply be, and now forgive me, because it's shiny. One of the, often the reasons we observed in our work in other countries, sometimes Leadership was interested because it's quite shiny, it's quite nice. It's nice to stand next to a cool tech entrepreneur. I remember my ministers in London, if Bill Gates called, they always picked up the phone and we said, look, why should Bill Gates give you advice on this? Well, I could be on the picture and every time they would meet Bill Gates, it was always the picture with Bill Gates that our ministers wanted. You know, let's not underestimate that, the shiny stuff, the shiny solution. So what we then see, is that people say, well, let's still do the system. I've actually talked largely about the soft infrastructure. What people want to say, and we've delivered 300 computers to schools. Anyone who says that's the solution, please stop them. There is a famous program 
It's called one laptop per child. That's still occasionally a politician. I think President Kenyatta embraced it. And in Kenya, again, they tried to implement it, where they said, oh, we're going to get every child a laptop. It's cost a lot of money, by the way. The evaluations in every single country in the world have shown that these programs don't work. Because the more difficult thing is the soft side. It's never the hard. Because most many people have access to the phone. You don't need the laptop anymore. You design the system for the laptop. In Kenya, it was part of the election platform, so it was implemented in Kenya. And after spending $340 million, it was written off. <laughs> and nothing was done with it. So just be aware, it's not about the computer. It's because there is a phone. It's about the system, and it's about the software and the systems. So. Then when they come as well, we have the solution, it's all hardware, that's not a solution. That's not where you work. And then finally is the leadership, then it's you. Champions at all levels. At the top, people that empower people to actually get the change driven. That's what we saw in India, in Bangladesh, in Togo, in Ethiopia. And all just across the system, understand the blockers and why they're blocking. But strengthen the enables and enablers and put them in central positions. And I'm thinking of you, you know. You are these kind of people. Um, you know, where do we next go in Nigeria? Well, we have some good stuff to start with. The underlying principles of the EID program is pretty good. I'm not quite sure how they think of the data storage and the use of it in other ways, but it's okay. The NIN system, all these things are essential. Now it's a matter of thinking how can it be used and how can it be scaled so that every citizen can be reached. Payment systems you have. You have capability in society, and you have political will at very, very many levels. You have infrastructure and inclusion challenges, capability and understanding, but you also have risks of capture and resistance to change. You have to be part of these change makers. You, you, are, you have the choice here. Oh, it's a pity we don't see this. Ah, it's coming. You have a choice. That's where I started. You could say nothing to do with me. I can stay ignorant and not try to understand how Uber makes money or how Amazon makes money. Oh, I can't be bothered, no, not important. You'll learn a lot from it. You could resist, you could plead ignorance and say irrelevance, or you could embrace, you could learn fast, and you could build in the end what you need to do, is build better services for people and business in this country. Thank you very much. Stop, don't stop, don't stop. Thank you. Professor Stefan Deccan. He has just giving it to all. And uh, one thing he said, capacity is being able and willing to do what? To sit down at home? No, to do something. To do something, as I said earlier. Somebody once said that we are wonderful people in terms of articulating great policies. Then the challenge is in implementation. But I'm sure that this time around, it will be a different story. Put your hands together for him again. I know it's not going to be possible to assimilate everything just like that, but I don't know if there's an arrangement so people can have access to it. Uh -huh. One thing I want to let you know is that what is going on here is being streamed on all the platforms of uh, the head, office of the head of uh, civil service. A uh, permanent secretary just sent a message that he is following us online. So for all those who are with us virtually, we say thank you for being there. Let's give them a round of applause. 
We are going to take questions and answers. I asked him to sit so he can rest, but he's going to take note of your questions. Then he will come up to answer. There are three people with microphones, one here, one there, and one here. So all you need to do is indicate, and I will determine the role that will, um, the question is going to come from. I know our very important personalities would like to make maybe one or two comments. Just let us know. So if you have any question or maybe a comment, please be as brief as possible. Or adventure somebody, ask the question you have in mind. There's no need to repeat the question. Thank you very much. Yes, who's going first? All right, yes, please give us your name, your office or organization, and straight to the question. Um, I stand on a system protocol. Mine is just um, a question. I'm from Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. Um, it's, this is something that most of us have clamored for, the digitization. But my question is, what is the sustainability program that we put in place for this? And then we are, we are, we are so uh, fond of uh, issue of um, system collapse and breakdown. Do we have program to back up the document so that we don't lose everything at once, especially when your system crashes? Then we know that our government you, don't, you can't do this successfully without um, power. So what is the plan also in ensuring that there is like 24-hour uh, powering of this system so that we don't have issues? Because when the systems are down, all the oppression is shut down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We take five questions, then he will respond. So we take the second one from there, then you move to the other. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nokam Ibrahim from the Federal Ministry of Transportation. I'd love to stand on existing protocol. There are two questions I think will be necessary. One is a recommendation, and one is a question. My first question goes with, how does the digitalization improve synergy between MDAs. I would like to suggest that in the lecture, I observed that there's a point where unified system was recommended. In the process of doing recommendation, how is data protection a key factor for protection of uh, Nigeria's data? Thank you. Okay, let's take from, oh, the, yes, behind you, hello, behind you. Thank you very much. I stand on the existing protocol. My name is Magnus Ojono from the National Gallery of Art. Now I have informed by the head of service that some agencies, particularly the head of service, has uh, fully digitalized. My problem would be for other agencies that are lagging behind. How is it possible to interpret? How are we going to ensure synergy between those who have already gone ahead and those who are going to start? Thank you very much. One more person. One more person from there. Okay. Please. Any person from here? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Sunu on the existing protocol. I'm Dr. Abdul Malik Wailura from Pyramids of Agriculture Rural Development. And my take here is that uh, we don't have any option than to digitize our services. But as we digitize, we know we are putting not only the government information into the public platform domain, but also surrendering personal details of the civil servant or the participants, the actors. So what are the safeguards that will be put in place? I'm taking, I'm taking this in particular in regard to Cambridge Analytica experience. 
I hope the response for someone respond to this, please. Thank you. Any other? All right, Prof. Please make him work again. <laughs> Give me a round of applause so you get his strength. Yes, yes. Yep. So, so let me look, look some of these questions. Is, so, so when I hear these questions, is, is that sense of concern, you know, how, how can this be done? And, um, you know, so how do we sustain this? How do you get it in context of, of power and so on? So there's, there's a number of things that are less problematic than you may, than you may think, okay? If you, upload system, if you upload data in some cloud-based system, it won't be lost, you know? <laughs> it is there. Um, there are ways of doing this, and you, but, you, but, but the more important thing is that you need to think about the storage. And so you need, so there is a concern that sometimes things get set up, and actually there is little consideration really of how does this storage system now going to work? And you need to bring in the right technical expertise because technically it is perfectly possible to have backup systems, you know, um, there are issues with data localization, if I may put it like this. Some of the Indian data are backed up outside India. Um, so you may worry about it, you want to think about it, but, you, but there are ways of doing this. It's, it may seem hocus pocus, but it is a bit like that because actually these things are quite striking, but there is a technical solution for it. So the backup itself, that first question is not there. Of course, there's the power issue and, and, and I can't ignore that. And I, um, and that is such a priority in this uh, country. The second thing is about the synergies that, uh, and the catching up. Now, one of the great things about um, new technologies is that the biggest risk takers are the first ones who adopt it. <laughs> so if you worry that your de department hasn't quite done it, I would say lucky you because you can learn from the errors of the other department and you can probably do it cheaper. So it's not about you will stay behind. You know, the experience is that, that this catch-up can work very well. We saw that in the Indian system, where actually rather than slowing down after a bit, the uptake accelerated. The rollout of the system accelerated more departments because they, they learned how to, to, to use this. So again, this is possible, but it needs leadership. It needs management. It needs people wanting to lead and learning from the mistakes from others. And it needs to be, you know, it, it needs people like, like you in, the, in, in this room. Now, the final thing that, uh, that, that, that I got, and it's in the sense it's two questions, and it always comes up, is this personal detail stuff, this data stuff, the kind of worry about, you know, civil servants' data will be public and so on. Now, I mean, this is essentially an issue of cybersecurity. One of the things that we've definitely learned is to some of the most basic protection, it's not so hard. So the way, as I was alluding to, is that if you built in the security in your system when you start, you can actually get that. You know, that's now the Indian experience. They build it in. Now, you may not be safe with that necessarily from every possible hack and whatever, but you know, from the cybersecurity experts, I know we have in Oxford a particular center focusing on cybersecurity within my department. Uh, and they would say, oh, look, there's certain things that we know what to do, and, and actually the basic security, the protection can be done. But actually most cybersecurity leaks follow from human error, from leaving doors open, so to speak, to the system. You know, from using as password, password, using as pin codes, one, two, three, four. That's how the biggest, the most common problems uh, come occur. So there's some basic hygiene that people need to be treat, learn, really taught when then they're working in the civil service of how actually how to avoid the most obvious cybersecurity issues. So it is there because what it doesn't need, mean, what the last question suggested, that personal details will suddenly be in the public domain. No, no. You can actually set up the systems that this will never happen. 
but he needs to program it in and set it up. And so I didn't give you a talk on cybersecurity, but you know, every department will need to get real thinking about how secure are the systems that I'm using and I'm setting them up. And this is the thing. The Indian system, Athar, in its very early days was hacked. But then actually they've managed, broadly speaking, to totally secure it. And it is possible, you know, there is the expertise and it's, it's actually not rocket science, it's actually simpler than that. So you can actually do sensible things. There will always be someone ahead of the game and it's not that it's always safe, but as seen from the citizens, you can do huge amounts. And it comes down to thinking very carefully, what do you store? You know, why should you store um, too many details about the individual? If it's an ID system, it should be sufficient information to identify you, which is usually name, date of birth, maybe one feature, or maybe biometric, and that's it. You don't need to have then their address and their telephone number stored, because then you open it up to be much more attractive for any hack uh, or other person to leak that stuff. So you think about it from the beginning and just think sensibly. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, further questions or comments? All right. At this point, um, I want to invite again the head of uh, the civil service of the Federation to come and make a presentation to Professor Deccan. Put your hands together for her, please. And um, in making in that presentation, um, Honorable Walid Edu, the SBA to the president, will join her. Then um, the retired. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, it appears she's going to perform this role alone, all by herself. The next program, which is public presentation of the revised public service rules, uh, uh, that's when uh, the Honorable and others will join. Not now, sir. The next one. Uh -huh. Please put your hands together for the head of civil service of the Federation. Um, Professor Stefan Deccan, please, can you come up here? Um, Professor, please come and stand here. You know, the last time you came to Nigeria, um, most of the permanent secretaries, you know, were in awe of you. And they actually thought that, you know, when we were going to have the Civil Service Week, they are the ones that insisted that we had to invite you to come back to Nigeria. And after this very, very intelligent lecture, I think it is just apt for me to present this on behalf of every civil servant here in Nigeria. We appreciate you. We thank you for your love for our country. Uh, because each time we ask you to come, you're always willing and excited to come here to Nigeria. So on behalf of oh the camera people are not getting us. Okay. Sorry, Prof, come this way, yes. Thank you. So on behalf of all civil servants, we present um, this to you. I think Pamsek, I think you need to open it so that uh, yes. we will see. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay, and also this is just a token from the Office of the Head of Service um, in appreciation of your coming here this morning. Thank you very much. Okay, so as you go back home to the UK, you are taking a piece of Nigeria back with you. I hope you'll put it and you'll actually enjoy it in your home. Thank you. Thank you. So, so allow me to do a vote of thanks to you, to, to all civil servants. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm one of you. I've always cherished being a civil servant, and I wish you all the best. And, but thank you for the kind attention, for the invitation. And uh, I wish you just get luck, good luck. I wish you good luck in, uh, in implementing all the things that you're trying to do at the moment. Thank you very much. Please another round of applause. And now would like um, um, the head of civil service of the Federation, she's not going back to her seat, would like uh, the, the retired uh, heads of service and permanent secretaries to join her. And I've already mentioned Honorable Edu, the SPA to the president on monetary policy. Please join her for the unveiling of the Revised Public Service Rules Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware that for quite some time, the public service rule, which is the ground norm for operations of the civil service, had undergone review with a view to making it more up to date to tackle the challenges that are bedeviling the Federal Civil Service and our passion for reform. President Mohamed Buhari, before the termination of that administration, gracefully approved a new Federal Civil Service public service rule. It is my honor and privilege to be here before you to present it as it is now being unveiled by the head of the civil service, joined by our forebearers and Mr. Wali Edu. You have the floor, man. 
Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. I think it's just to add that this unveiling means that we can start the implementation of the revised public service rules starting from today. So we present this to the public. Thank you. Autographic for them. That's what I said. Hello. Hello. Are you good? Are you happy? Uh, can I ask for another round of applause for everyone, please? At this point, um, and I want to thank the permanent secretary for the role he played. Please give him a round of applause. He had to explain everything. And I'm inviting him to come for the vote of thanks. And he is Olufemi Michael Olon Rutola, Permanent Secretary, SPSO, OHCSE. A round of applause. Make him welcome. Thank you. I urge you all to allow me to stand on already established protocol. My task is simple. We are close to the end of this ceremony, and my duty is to express, on behalf of the head of the Civil Service of the Federation, our collective, sincere, and heartfelt gratitude to all for your contribution to the success of this event. As it is customary, our prime gratitude is to the almighty God for his mercy upon our nation, Nigeria, in general, and to all of us for the means he has bestowed on us to contribute to this commemoration and to witness it. We acknowledge God. We pray that he accept our thanks in his holy name. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me send through the special advisor to Mr. President of Monetary Policies, Honorable Wally Edmund, our thanks to His Excellency, the President and Commander-in-Chief of Armed Forces, President Bola Hamed Tinumbu GCFR, for his vision, support, and confidence reposed in the leadership and management of the Federal Civil Service and its commitment to the Renewed Hope Agenda. To the head of the Civil Service, Ma, we are most grateful for your firm, purposeful leadership. The commemoration of this year's Civil Service 
has been driven by your passion for excellence, and we remain most grateful. To the Chairman, Federal Civil Service Commission, ably represented here today, and the Chairman, Council of Retired Permanent Secretaries and Heads of Service, we appreciate your presence here today, and we remain gratefully, greatly indebted for your wise counsel and goodwill messages. Thank you, sirs. As the saying goes, you cannot clap with one hand. The Federal Civil Service willingness for reform on one part has been met by the good support of many partners. Prime among them are the AIG Foundation and Nigeria Shippers Council who partly sponsored this event. It is therefore most appropriate that we show our gratitude to you for this support. In a special way, let me make a special mention of Mr. and Mrs. Aegi Mokwede for their consistent support. To our distinguished lecturer, Professor Stefan Deacon, there is obviously no doubt that we have had an interesting session of intellectual exchange with our highly reputable scholar from the University of Oxford University. We are grateful, sir. Thank you for your brilliant and insightful thoughts. A special mention must be made of our special invitees, particularly the Bauchi State Head of Service, who at the shortest notice accepted to be our special guest here today. Service chiefs ably represented here, other heads of paramilitary organizations, heads of government agencies, we remain most grateful for your esteemed presence. I also have the honor and privilege to recognize the participation at this event of prolific writers amongst civil servants who will exhibit their works outside after this, uh, our gathering here. Thank you for your support. Finally, let me thank everyone who is here present. We have made a deliberate effort to encourage prompt attendance at public events. And we note that most of us who are here today came in quite on time before the scheduled time for this event. We thank you for your presence. Finally, let me thank the gentlemen of the press who are here with us today and urge that we expect that you will project the happenings here in the best manner possible. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. I was eagerly waiting to hear and thank you, the master of ceremony. But as usual, they always forget the master of ceremony. All right. I thank me. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you. Um, it's been nice. And um, I want to say that today uh, is a new day. A new day has been born. The next thing is for us to walk into this new day and continue working. Um, Professor Stefan Deacon, thank you very much. It's a pleasure meeting you. Now, uh, we have exhibitions, and it's in the other, um, just as you walk out, you walk in, and um, I have announcement, the exhibition, you would have, you would find creative works and books of civil servants. I like this one, books of civil servants, because apart from what we're doing, the work does not stop us from harnessing our innate talents, like writing, singing, and other talents. You need to have other streams of income, the way it is and the way we are going. So um, we need to encourage them. You definitely, the head of uh, civil service of the Federation will lead the special guest to that place. And from that place, they will go to where they're going to have their refreshment. And the rest of us here will wait here and uh, we'll receive our package. It's part of the announcement, but I'll take it formally. All our VIPs, 
on the first and second row will accompany the head of service, civil service, to the exhibition stand and thereafter to the VIP lounge um, for their refreshment. Ushers are by the door to lead them. Uh, all other participants are to remain seated. Refreshments will be served for only those on their seats. So I want to thank you as we rise for the national anthem. You can sing the national anthem as it's going. Feel free to sing it. Make it a declaration. bless Nigeria and God bless you.
Time and time. 